How are you? Good to see you tonight. I am doing well. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yep. Getting better, getting stronger. I feel good. I feel good. Well, we are in this series that we're talking about facing uh, unmasked, facing mental pain. And we're talking about different types of pain uh, throughout this series. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, when it comes to pain, you know, I was wondering what's the worst kinds of pain. So I looked it up online and here's what I found. Here's just some of them. There's, I guess, cluster headaches. If you've had that, they say that's one of the worst kinds of pain. Of course, childbirth, shingles, kidney stones, gallstones, tooth abscesses, severe burns, a spinal tap. They sound painful. Uh, I went through something real painful when I was uh, a uh, sophomore in high school. I was a pole vaulter and uh, I uh, was at a track meet and the coach wasn't there. A couple of varsity guys were there and they were kind of, they were coaching me and trying to teach me to go higher. And, and they said, you know, if you, if you move the standards away from the mat, you'll, instead of like this arc like that, you'll be more like straight up and down and you know, you'll go higher and it made sense. So I did that and pulled it back and I went higher advance to the next level. And so they, they said, the principle is the same. Every time you move it back, you go higher. But what I didn't realize is that it's actually, the mat is there for a reason. <laughs> so so they, pu they pulled it so far back, I, I no longer had any kind of like arc at all. I just went straight up, won the meat, but came straight back down into the box. My foot went in there, smashed my, my foot, just shattered it. So it was like at a 90 degree angle. And, you know, and, uh, and actually I was not in pain. Uh, I was, uh, my, my body was in shock. So I was like, my head was buzzing. I was confused. I was cold and clammy. I was sick to my stomach. So they hauled me into the, uh, in, into the locker room, said, well, we'll go and find the coach. And, and, uh, they didn't tell him where I was. And so it took him a long time and I'm there, I'm dehydrated, I'm thirsty. And, and eventually I ended up getting to the doctor and two surgeries later. And, and, and after the shock, I came out, of, it hurt a lot. You know, the, the pain eventually came, but I guess my, my body just shut down. And so sometimes the pain can just be so overwhelming. You just, you shut down. And uh, we're going to be talking not about physical pain, but about emotional pain, about hidden pain, hidden wounds. And, uh, and that happens as well. Sometimes we get so overwhelmed with, with emotional pain, with emotional wounds that we don't know how to uh, process that. You know, so we, we shut down or we become self-destructive. There's a lot of ways that people uh, work, you know, try to work through that stuff. And we get, uh, there's plenty of, of pain out there. And there's the pain of, you know, the rejection of somebody or somebody says something very negative, maybe somebody very important to you. There's a um, Abuse. We looked at some of those things last week. The abuse, abandonment. You know, there's ridicule, criticism. There's hatred. There's prejudice. There's injustice. There's all kinds of things like that. And we can get it from society. Uh, it comes from sometimes our own family members. You know, maybe a parent. You know, or a, or, or a sibling or somebody. And then it can happen just on the schoolyard or some other place. Now. I've talked to a number of people as being, I've pastored now for a number of years and I've talked to hundreds of thousands of people really. And, and, uh, and, and what I've discovered is there's some truths about people. Number one is, is that everybody has a hidden pain. Everybody. I mean, some people hide it better than others, but everybody, you can't go through life without, without experiencing some of that. And, uh, and so, you know, so that's, that's true. But not only that, uh, it, that uh, what I've also discovered is that in most cases, emotional pain heals slower than physical pain. You know what I mean? You break your leg and then you don't necessarily think about it again once it's fixed. And even if you do remember it, like me just recounting when I broke my leg, I just, you know, there was kind of a detachment. I just broke my leg and I told you about it. But when we have emotional wounds, we relive those. When we think about them, we, it fires up those emotions again. And so not only was it incredibly painful, but the pain, it's e easier to remember. It's easier to dial that up. And so God has a, a plan for, for all of us. And part of his plan is, is that we enter into salvation. We enter into a covenant with him through Christ. And part of that covenant is that we receive, we receive healing. 
that God is involved in our lives at an intimate level. He wants to bring healing, sometimes physically, but many times it's, it's emotional healing. He's, he's concerned about when we have hidden wounds. Notice uh, at the top of your outline, I, I pointed out that one of God's names in, in the Hebrew Bible in, in Exodus 15 is, is that God says, I am the one who heals you, a Jehovah Rapha. It means he, he, that's part of our, our, our covenant blessing is that we, we serve a God and we're in, in relationship with a God who wants to bring healing to us. And then in Psalm 147, for example, he says, God heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. What's he talking about? He's not talking about physical healing there. He's talking about the, the emotional healing, the, 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 the brokenhearted, the part of us that's very tender inside of us. And there's a process that God goes through to bring healing. Now, it's, I put it down, the five things that happens, but it's not necessarily in this order. But as you see, when Jesus healed a lot of people, and, uh, and, and, and you know, physically and emotionally, and we see when God's healing people that these things are part of, of the process of receiving healing from, from the Lord. Number one is this revealing my hurt. I got to reveal my hurt. Unless we face it straight on, unless we admit it, unless we're honest about where we're at, if we keep stuffing it down, we deny it, we pretend it's not there, we don't deal with it effectively or helpful, you know, in helpful ways, then it just festers. It, we don't really move forward down the healing path. Psalm, one, Psalm 39, verses 2 and 3 in the New Century, David said, I kept very quiet, but I became even more upset. I became very angry as I, as though I, as I thought about it, my anger Burned, And so he says here, he kept it inside and he became more resentful. That it, that it became more self-destructive. It's a burning inside his own heart. Something that's like breaking down and, 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 uh, and becoming uh, destructive to ourselves. And so this is, this is how sometimes people handle their emotional pain. Is that they actually enter into kind of like self-destructive types of behavior. For example, cutting is a very popular one among young people. You know, they cut because they're, they, maybe they feel out of control. Maybe they, there's so much pain in their lives that it's, it, it gives some kind of relief. When they, when they cut, uh, they feel like um, uh, there's, some, there's a calming to it. There's, uh, there's a release of endorphins. And then they feel better. Of course, it ends up being where they feel afterwards. They often feel guilty. They feel shameful. They have deeper emotional pain. This is not a real... Uh, a real solution, but in the moment it feels like it is. I read some statistics on this. 20% uh, of all American teenagers report they've purposely injured themselves, self-abuse. And then 90% of self-injuries start in their teenage years. 40% are male, 60% are female. 50% of cutters report sexual abuse in their, in their, in their lives. 50% say that they began cutting at age 14, and they're still doing it in their 20s. And then out of all of those, they, most of them overwhelmingly said, a friend told them how to cut, where to cut, how it'll feel, how to go about it. And so this is real common, of self-destruction. You know, the, we used to call it back in the day, mutilating the flesh, but now the common term is, is cutting. And so I want you to watch a, a video drama of a story of a girl who uh, cuts and she says why and kind of her path through that. Watch this. The first time I did it, I didn't even think. I just needed some relief. It hurt, but not that badly. It's just that I've been hurt before and sometimes his name starts with a J or an M or T. His eyes always looked through me, always hoping that I would understand, that I could leave the table and just be friends. I would smile and nod and try to avoid his eyes, focus on the hands that once held me and shaped me underneath I love yous, and it felt as if I had been stabbed in the pit of my stomach, as if my insides would spill onto the floor. But I held it together, and I absorbed the pain underneath my skin, though it burned and itched to escape. So I tried it one day. It was just a scratch. I pressed the blade against my arm and watched a thin line appear. 
bright red against my skin. And the pain felt good because I was in control. I did it with my own hands. I became an artist and my body was my canvas. I started with my arms, moving to my legs and my stomach, each time with fear that I would stop feeling, that I would become dumb again. I wanted to start over, try to hide my scars with long sleeves, or wear pants even in the hot summers. But then I met him. He healed my wounds and whispered that it was already a finished work of art. I didn't have to hide. I was still beautiful. I wear my scars now, like tracks to my soul, becoming a book for those who can decipher the symbols and telling my story for those who care to hear. So that's one person's story. Um, there's lots of different ways of, of inflicting self-harm, though. This is, that's obviously one of them. There's, there's also abuse of alcohol, abuse of, of, uh, of food. There's abuse of drugs. There's, there's burning your skin. There's just, there's so many. There's, of course, then some people try to commit suicide. Some people are successful. They're in so much emotional pain, they don't know how to, uh, how to, how to, how to deal with it. And it seems to be the only reasonable way to handle it. So uh, when we're talking about emotional pain and, and, and facing it, it means that we, we have to say, kind of like what you saw in the drama where the person said, you know, meeting Christ, allowing God and revealing uh, where you're at uh, to the Lord. Because that's an important part of it, being honest to God, saying, God, this is really where I'm at. And I hope you already knows. He was there when you uh, experienced those emotional pains. He hurt with you. And so it's just, but that process of letting God into that part of your life. So that's an important, uh, honest to yourself. Hey, this is, this is something that, well, that I'm dealing with, honest to God, and then honest to others. So there's, there's a part uh, where we're, of, a part of our healing involves one another. That's part of the reason God gave us the body of Christ. We, we need one another. There's a healing element that comes from that. And so you need to find at least one person that you trust, somebody with skin and bones who you can share your story with. The Bible says, when I kept things to myself, I felt weak deep inside me, and I moaned all day long. So there's this moaning, the pain that goes, that just seems to never end. This, this inward groaning. And so that's, that's, a, that's a part of, of, uh, of sharing. Now, if you don't have somebody you can share with, that we have our healing ministries uh, that uh, you can call up and make an appointment. And we have uh, licensed counselors that would be happy to talk to you and uh, listen to your story. But you need that part of it. You know, honest to yourself, honest to God, and then find somebody who you can trust and share your story with. Number two is, is release those who have hurt me. Now, a lot of times we feel like we're victims because uh, there's abuse that happens in our lives. People take advantage of us. There's, there's, there's things that come up that can embitter us if we don't know how to, to uh, release that and let it go. And so forgiveness is what's, what's needed. I was reading about uh, one of bi the biographers for the painter, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He was painting The Last Supper. And I guess he had this very bitter, uh, angry, resentful fight with another painter. And so he came up with the idea when he was painting The Last Supper. He goes, I know what I'll do. I'm going to paint this guy's face in the, in, you know, for Judas Iscariot. And so he does. He paints it because it's a, a, progress, a work in progress. As people are coming by to look, well, they, they know who that guy is. He lives in their town, and they can see what he did. And he's thinking, hey, I got him back for all time. This guy's face is going to be there in the place of Judas Iscariot. And so he continues on with the painting, and then he saved Jesus' face for last. And according to the biographer, he got stuck. He just couldn't come up with a face for Jesus. And then he realized that it was connected to, for what he had done to uh, this guy that he was angry at. So he changed the guy's face, put just a, a, a face that didn't represent anybody, and then he was able to complete and finish you know, the, the, the Last Supper and, and put Jesus' face on. Now, the point of that is, is that it affects our lives. When we get stuck, when we think we, we really only have enough emotional energy 
to either get revenge or, or, or to get healed, you know, to, to, to get even or to forgive. We, we really don't have enough emotional energy for both. And, and here's the problem is, is if we get even, if we get revenge, it, it doesn't really help our emotion. We don't really feel better in that process. Some of you have had that opportunity. You've gotten somebody back and you don't really, you know, the emotions are still there. The pain is still there. The healing comes through forgiveness. That's why the Bible talks about that. That that's the process. You go, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, they probably, I'm sure they don't. That's not what it's about. It's not that they deserve it. It's that you need it for you. And God, he, he a lot of times we don't want to forgive because we're thinking, well, I got to remember this because they did this thing. And if I don't remember it, they're going to get away with it. And we have to kind of subconsciously almost, we're thinking, I've, somebody's got to remember what that, that person did. And then we just hold on to that and hold on to that. But see, God remembers. He knows. And the Bible says that he's the one who meets out justice. He's the one. Nobody gets away with anything. And so the good news is since God remembers it, we don't have to. We can let it go. We can move on with our life and not get stuck in that, in that uh, emotional place where we're holding on to things and sapping our energy. Romans 12, verses 17 through 19 says, Never pay back evil for evil. Never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. I'm reading right now a, a uh, biography by Martin Luther King Jr. And just, just kind of reliving that stuff, it's, it's actually written like an autobiography because his wife gave the permission for somebody to, to write it like that. And all of his writings and all. It's a very interesting book, but it's just kind of reliving all of the things that happened in Montgomery and all of the abuse that happened when he was trying to get his civil rights and leading that movement. And, and he just kept, because it was teetered often on, hey, let's get back. And we're still kind of seeing some of that you know, in, in, in our day right now, right? With all of the things going against the police and the injustice and people, you know, there's the tendency to become violent. And, and he was, and that was true in, the, in his day. There was always this tendency that things could turn violent. And he kept saying, no, we're not going to do that. That's not what this movement is about. We're going to, we're going to have, uh, you know, civil disobedience, but it's going to be nonviolent, nonviolent civil di disobedience. And he said, that's redemptive because when you suffer for, for when you have unjust suffering, he says that brings redemption. And he really changed the whole society, the fabric of the society from where they were. And we're not done yet, but from where we were to where, it, where Martin Luther King brought it. I mean, just huge, it just changed the fabric of the society through nonviolence, through forgiveness, through not always avenging yourselves, always, not always trying to get somebody back. And uh, so, of course, in this day and age, we don't have that kind of leader. So we have we have uh, what we see going on in the news every day. Psalm 56, 8 says, You, God, have kept a record of all my tears. I love that. He says he, he keeps a record, not just the, the physical tears, but the, the, the inward pain. God says, all of that, I see it all. And I keep a record of it. I'm watching. You don't have to, you don't have to keep a record of it because I've got it for you. Jesus certainly understood abuse. And uh, look at how he responded. When Jesus suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He could have done that. He had the power to do that. It says he left his case in the hands of God. You know, Jesus had six wounds there during the, uh, those, the, during the passion. He had, he, his head was wounded, his face, and his back from the stripes on his back. And then, of course, his hands, nails went through him, his feet, nails went through him, and then a spear on his side, six different wounds. But the ones that hurt the worst were not even the physical wounds. It was the betrayal by a close friend. It was the rejection. It was the hatred. It was the injustice. Those are the things that hurt the worst. And some of you can relate to that. I mean, that's the stuff. That, that's why we're talking about that today, about the kinds of emotional pain that comes from those things and how hard it is to, to move forward. Number three, if we're going to get healing, First, we have to be honest with ourselves, with God, with somebody else. Then we have to release that. We can't just hold on to it. Then we replace our old feelings with God's truths. See, our tendency is to hold on to something and we just, like a recorder, we just hold on to it. And we play it over and over and over. Maybe it's something that, uh, that somebody said to us or uh, said over us. 
and we just, and maybe we believed it. Maybe it's somebody who you really respected or, or admired or a significant person in your life. And then we just, especially if you're young when that stuff happens, our tendency is to believe those things that aren't true about us. And so we have the self-defeating thoughts, which create self-defeating feelings. And we start to uh, fall into this uh, self, uh, uh, self-hatred, self-abuse uh, towards ourselves. And so a part of that is God wants to, to say, hey, I've got something I have to, to say about you. And so part of it is saying, God, I'm going to replace those things that are, are based on lies about me and replace it with the truth that you say about me. The Bible says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And so part of it is saying, God, I'm going to let you change the way I see myself, change the way I saw you and and, and the way I remember things happening and that you weren't there and, 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 and just saying, God, you were there and help me to see that. Help me to see how you were part of my life all along. Part of that process is getting into God's Word. God's Word says a lot about who He says we are. So that's why Satan's goal is to keep you out of God's Word, to make you too busy so you don't have time for it. But God wants us, that's part of His way that He renews our mind. That's part of the way that He replaces those old, untrue things about us with the truth about us. So God's Word is huge. Another thing that, that I think uh, really hits us at an emotional level is worship. When we come in and, 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 and we worship and we sing, you know, songs and we start to, there's an there's a emotional thing that goes into singing, right? I mean, if we let it happen, I mean, it's easy to come in here and just kind of look around and, oh, so that's who's drumming today, and, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, and oh yeah, where's the, where's the keyboardist who's normally there? And you know, just, you know, and it's a little cold in here tonight. I mean, you, you know, you can just, you know, get into that or you can say, you know what, I'm going to be here to, to really encounter God, to let the Holy Spirit speak into me and in a deep way. And part of that means you, you step up to the plate. It means there's, there's, there's a part where you play. It's not just entertainment. It, it, you know who we're playing for? We're playing for God, all of us. They're just, these are just the lead musicians. We're also part of that. We're the choir, and, uh, and, we, and we sing uh, to God about God and, and allow Him to impact us at a deep level. And He wants to, st- and that's part of the way that He changes the way we, we see ourselves and feel about ourselves. But it takes that, that part where we come and we, we engage and we, uh, we give ourselves to that. And the third thing is, is God says that he has truths about you that he wants to teach you. And, uh, and, it, and, and seeing it from letting the Holy Spirit kind of change the way we see ourselves. It says, through what Christ would do for us, God decided to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We stand before him covered with his love. So is it true that we have no faults at all? No, it's not. But it is true because God says it's true. How is it true? Because Christ makes us new. It's through Christ's righteousness. And so that's something that is, is, is not only you get it mentally, but you also experientially you start to realize, hey, I'm living a life before God where I have not even a single fault. And, and so even though all these people told me I had, you know, I was this, I was that, I was no good, I was that, and I, and I wanted, and I, and I repeat those things all, this, all the time, you, you, you start to say, no, God, he's doing something different in me. And this is true when we enter into a relationship with Christ, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, because then it's Christ's righteousness that's put on us. And we live th- through our life before God through Christ. So that's the promise that comes by being a, by putting our faith in Christ. Number four, we refocus on the future. <clears throat> now, this is important that God has a future for us. He promises that an, all throughout Scripture. He says that we, that, that we don't just live in the past, that what's, often what's happened in the past, there's, there's, we can't just say, I'm going to forget it. The process of moving forward is to have a future. That's one of the problems with a lot of modern uh, psychology and therapy today is that they get, they get all focused on the past. Now, there's, I'm not saying there's no place for it, but some of it, that's all they do. And listen, if you, are, if, if you go to a, a, a counselor or a psychiatrist or psychologist, and they're not a believer, even if they say they're a believer, 
If they, if they say they might say they're a Christian, but if they're not, if their practices are not based on Scripture, are not based on the Bible. I suggest you run as fast as you can out of that place. Because I've talked to hundreds of people over the years that have gone to counseling for marriage counseling, for individual counseling, and they get all messed up. They end up worse. And they're trying to get better, and they're paying good money for that. But it's not based on God's word. Some, some Freud or somebody concocted some idea that they thought was good. They, they've never read the Bible. They're not interested in it. They're not redeemed in the Holy Spirit or any of that. And so they just give their secular viewpoint they, and, and, and often will end up worse than we are. So that is my, I, I just, I implore you, do not do that. It, I think counseling is fantastic, but it needs to be based on scripture. It needs to be based on God's word. Now, I want you to listen to some members of our church who experienced some significant emotional pain in their lives and how they how they got through that and, uh, and where they're at today. Would you watch this video of Joe and Bridget O'Hara? I'm Bridget O'Hara. And I'm Joe O'Hara. And we started coming to Vineyard in the year 2000. We, heard, we were here until about 2004. And then we left because of a job change. And we've been back now for about a year. In my past, I uh, was hurt. I was hurt by my father. I was hurt by other people. I was hurt... Um, you know, by teachers, by schoolmates. It spilled out in every relationship I had, um, especially into my marriage. And um, because of some other sins and, and things, um, my marriage was on rocks. It was, it was not good. At the same time, um, one of our children were abused at the hands of a neighbor. And um, it was very devastating. It was, it was the worst thing that I could ever imagine. And I held on to unforgiveness tight. I, I wanted it mine. I wanted revenge. Um, I wanted that person to pay for what had been done. I think that was a point where, you know, with the marriage and all that stress, I, I was at a point there where I could just walk away and say, you know what, this isn't, this isn't worth it. I, I went to a small group and um, a dear friend there could see inside those wounds, could see inside the hurt, and I recommend that I attend a Forgive and Live group. Um, and Forgive and Live is a 12-week um, group um, that teaches about unforgiveness and forgiveness from a biblical foundation. And um, I knew what forgiveness was. Um, I could, I knew that it was a Christian thing to do, to say I forgive them, and why oh, yeah, I forgive them, you know, but in my heart, I didn't. Um, deep down, there was no forgiveness. So when I went through the crew, I learned what God said about forgiveness and how important it is, and that all healing stems from forgiveness. And I, I truly believe that. Um, I had a lot of healing in other areas, but until I experienced real forgiveness, um, both for myself and forgiving, forgiving other people, um, I don't know that I could have healed in all the areas that, that were broken. I went to Forgive and Live mainly because of um, the hurt and the pain that was being brought into the marriage. I was thinking that, you know, this isn't going to help me at this point. But um, kind of talked me into going, and I went. Uh, it, it did open a lot of other things, childhood things that I hadn't even thought of that had affected me in the way I was, um, and things that I had brought into marriage as well. Forgiving now it comes easy in some aspects. Um, you don't think about it. You, it's just kind of part of, part of life. At one point, I was actually able to go to my child's perpetrator and face him face to face and forgive him. Everybody comes broken and everyone has stories. And the Lord forgives me, therefore I will forgive them and do it from the bottom of my heart. It's a great story, huh? I want to recommend, for some of you who have emotional pain, maybe somebody has hurt you deeply, 
and uh, you're struggling with that. And so I want to recommend Forgive and Live. It's a ministry, a program a min that we're launching, I think, in just the next week or two. You can sign up at our healing ministries table. Uh, I love it because a couple of reasons. Number one is, is it's based on the Bible. And as I just said earlier, that's important that it's based on God's word. Number two, it's based on a conversion experience that part of God's plan for us is that we become new inside, that God has this capacity to kind of give us a fresh start. And that's important as well to recognize that and to receive the Holy Spirit's fresh start that he wants to bring to us. Thirdly is, is it's based on a community experience, that we don't do this alone. It's part of walking alongside other people, letting other people pray for us and encourage one another. us. And sometimes just getting prayer, like at the end of this service, we'll give you an opportunity to come receive prayer. Sometimes that's just stepping out in faith is all that's needed. And, and then God kind of meets you halfway. But it, it's, it's stepping out. And so for, you know, for some of you, you know, joining Forgive and Live will be that stepping out, that, you know, stepping out and uh, trusting him. And then fourthly, I love it because it's future focused. It's about what God, God has a plan for you. He has some good things for you. And so we're not just, we don't just get stuck in the past. We address that, but then we move on and we say, God, here's what God has for us in the future. I love what Job says there in Job 11. It says, put your heart right, reach your trouble, uh, excuse me, reach out to God then face the world again, firm and courageous. So there's that future focus. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. Now, Job knew a lot of pain. He had a lot of physical pain. He had a lot of emotional pain. And yet he says, it's, it's in this process of looking forward that God does some of his, his, his best work. Proverbs 4.25 says, look straight ahead with honest confidence. Don't hang your head in shame. So that's part of the way we move forward in healing is, is recognize God's got a plan for me and it's a good plan. Number five, reach out to help others. Now this is an important part. This is kind of like, how do you know when you're healed? You say, well, you know, it's, you know, physically you can look at it and say, well, it's, you know, take an x-ray and say, I'm healed. But how do you know when you're emotionally healed? This is it. When you, when you can allow God to use your pain in a redemptive way to serve others, that is, that, is, that is the way of saying, I'm, I'm walking in this healing. God's brought this healing to my life. For 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says, God comforts us every time we have trouble. So when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the same comfort that God has given us. You see, that's part of the reason we do, we have small groups. Small groups is where that happens, where we comfort one another, we encourage one another, and God's healing is visible, and, 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 and it's manifest in that place. God loves to bring comfort, and as I said, he loves to give us a fresh start. Notice it says there, this last verse says, when someone becomes a Christian, he is a brand new person inside, circle that, inside. He is not the same anymore, a new life has begun. And so that inside part means God starts from the inside out and he works with some of those places that get us stuck it causes us to um, have problems in our relationships it causes us to have a hard time enjoying life and we get we can't see the future we can't we can't move forward we can't release our past we don't have emotional energy for all of it we start to have self-destructive behavior all of those things God says I want to give you a fresh start and I'm going to begin on the inside. Okay? So let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you care about each person here. Everybody here is important to you. And there's some here who have emotional pain. Maybe you have a broken heart. Maybe you have bitter memories, a damaged self-esteem. Maybe you've fallen into some of these self-defeating lifestyles or behaviors. Why not just, just start out and just say, God, I want to begin by just saying, I want to just be honest with you. I've got, you know, I haven't dealt with this. There's that emotional pain. If you're not willing to admit it, then that's kind of, we get stuck right there. Some of you just need to begin where just saying, God, I want to, I realize that there's pain in my heart. There's this hurt. There's this resentment. Anger, guilt, insecurities, fear, all those things. Scars, emotional scars. 
You say, God, I want to take this initial step and invite you into the process. Some of you need to just bring, allow forgiveness to happen. Not because they deserve it, but you just say, God, I'm just going to, I'm going to let that stuff go. I don't have enough emotional energy to hold on to that and to receive healing. I'm going to release those old feelings and replace them with new feelings based on your truth. God says that you matter to him. That you're usable, that you're acceptable, that you're lovable. You say, God, I want to look forward to my future. So you have something good for me. Thank you, Lord, that you brought me into this church family. If you've never asked Christ into your life, why not do that right now? Just say, Jesus Christ, I thank you for the gift that you brought through, through uh, the work of the cross that I can receive forgiveness, that I can receive a fresh start. You say, God, begin something new inside of me. Now, as we're just kind of have this, there's an atmosphere of just the Holy Spirit working in our hearts as we allow Him. I'm going to encourage, I want everyone to stand up now, okay? We're just going to kind of stay in this place of prayerfulness, okay?